now that the child has been safely recovered, we, we have limitations on what, what we can see. Tonight, Winnipeg police issue a rare amber alert for a missing child. The child turns up safe and sound, but questions are still swirling about why the alert was even issued. We've reached out to so many people. There's a new treaty lobster season on the horizon, but some Mi'kmaq fishers are still trying to right the wrongs of the last one. I'm concerned that it's going to be uh, uh, minimized or it's going to be rationalized, it's going to be justified. And school is out in Alberta over how old children need to be before they can learn about treaties and residential schools. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Brittany Hobson. It was presented to the public just before Christmas. The baby's law is meant to help First Nations families in Quebec investigate the dozens of cases of children reported missing or dead following hospitalizations outside their communities. The baby's law has yet to be approved by Quebec's National Assembly. And as Lindsay Richardson reports, it doesn't yet have full approval from the people it aims to help. On a été, uh, laissé dans l'indifférence. We were left in indifference, Francoise Rupert House said during this week's consultations on Quebec's Bill 79, the baby's law, drafted specifically for First Nations families with missing children. If passed, Bill 79 promises government help. C'est pas sûr qu'on guérit, mais euh, au moins avoir une certaine paix. Two of Rupert House's siblings vanished, like 45 other children born to Atikamek, Anishinaabe, and Inu families in Quebec. They disappeared or died during hospital stays between the 1950s and the 1980s. Everyone speaking Tuesday said communities still haven't healed. Encore aujourd'hui, il y a beaucoup de gens qui qui en tombent presque malades de ne pas connaître la réalité, de ne pas connaître qu'est-ce qui s'est passé réellement là. Avec leur, leur enfant. The MMIWG inquiry's Quebec-specific report called for the release of hospital records to these families, as well as a commission to investigate. Bill 79 promises Quebec will directly assist anyone who needs help to get the documents and gives the Minister of Indigenous Affairs power to investigate when information is withheld. MMIWG Commissioner Michelle Odette told Quebec officials it often is. Évidemment, les institutions, il y a du racisme, il y a eu des 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 comportements pour ralentir ou prendre plus de temps lorsqu'on demandait des documents. Ça, c'est un domaine qui n'était pas mon expertise, mais ça m'a frappé. Donc ça aussi, des fois, par des biens inconscients ou très conscients, va nous amener aussi des barrières. Law professor Geneviève Motard says Bill 79 lacks specifics about the kind of help Quebec will offer. Est-ce que le soutien se traduira concrètement par du financement pérenne, par du soutien technique, par des, du soutien en, par le voie d'expertise, par exemple, par de la traduction? Bref, il serait important que ces moyens soient précisés de manière à ce que les mécanismes qui seront mis en place soient effectifs, efficaces, eux égards aux droits des familles. De connaître la vérité. One hint about funding can be taken from the 2021 Quebec budget. When it was tabled last week, it included $2 million over two years to set up a support team at Indigenous Affairs and allow culturally adapted support for families. But when considering the scope of the issue and the decades that have passed... It's not a lot of money. AFNQL Regional Chief Ghislaine Picard says the approach has to go deeper. We've always insisted on the fact that uh, families will need to be supported. Uh, not only administratively, they'll need to be supported psych psychologically as well. So is that where this money is going to be coming from? If that's the case, that's not enough. After the budget unveiling, we asked Minister Ian Lafreniere whether he thought Quebec is investing enough to apply the MMIWG and Vien Commission's calls to action. I'm not doing statistics. Um, what I mean by that, I'm not trying to put, you know, just a check in a box stating that, yes, I've got maybe 50 call of action that have been answered. Because for some people, that 51st one or that 52nd will be so important for them. So I hate numbers. I'm working to change the, uh, the life of people. It's been revised once already, and with two days of hearings left, the baby's law may face another revision before it has approval. 
Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. We want to hear what you think. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Mi'kmaq aren't just preparing for the upcoming lobster season. They're also getting ready to sue the federal government and non-Indigenous fishermen for the violence that occurred last fall. The lawsuit filed last Friday by 43 Sabaganegadi lobster harvesters comes after the moderate livelihood fishery was launched last fall. That was met with violence from non-Indigenous fishermen. The statement of claim filed with the Nova Scotia Supreme Court alleges 29 non-Indigenous fishermen attacked the Mi'kmaq and that the Bay of Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association encouraged the violence while the RCMP and the Department of Fisheries failed to protect the Mi'kmaq. None of the allegations have been proven in court. Chief Mike Sack hopes the lawsuit will find out what went wrong. We've reached out to so many people, you know, the Prime Minister was on TV saying that he had questions that were not answered. Um, I've asked Commissioner Lockheed questions that were not answered. Um, getting nowhere, so hopefully this holds those accountable and, you know, generations to come will not have to put up with what we went through and, and hopefully we have a more successful, peaceful season coming up. APTN News has learned that the Ontario Provincial Police spent $16 million over the last six months in Caledonia. The information was obtained by APTN through Ontario's Freedom of Information Act. According to the documents, the money went to salaries, hotels and food for an undisclosed number of officers at the site where the Haudenosaunee-led occupation of lands in Caledonia took place. Caledonia has been a hot spot for more than a decade because of development on land people from six nations of the Grand River say belongs to them. The latest clash took place last July when a site called 1492 Landback Lane was established. Police moved in with force and members of the camp responded with blockading a rail line and putting up barricades. More than $3 million alone was spent in November by police. For more on this story, go to aptnnews.ca. An Amber Alert in Manitoba was sent out Tuesday evening after what Winnipeg police say was an abduction of a two-year-old boy. The mother of the boy turned herself in and has been charged. With more on the situation, here's Daryl Stranger. Yeah, Brittany, we really don't know a whole lot about this situation as it is still unfolding. But the latest that we do know is that Winnipeg police have charged the mother of the boy with abduction and she was released on conditions, although they did not specify what those conditions were. Now, Winnipeg police issued an Amber Alert just after 8 p.m. Central Time for the whereabouts of a two-year-old boy. Now, police said they were informed of a child abduction a few hours earlier and that he might be with his mother. Now, police said the mother left a pre-arranged supervised visit with the child without legal authorization and in a manner that immediately began to raise concern among other caregivers. Now, police could not divulge very much information, but the, a variety of factors led to the decision to issue an Amber Alert. And now that the child has been safely recovered, we, we have limitations on what, what we can say. What I did say in the, uh, in, in the reading of this release was that investigators looked at, at the framework uh, from a legal standpoint. They looked at family dynamics. They looked at information that was available to us on the individuals that were involved. And that led us to a position where we were looking at the likelihood of an Amber Alert. Now, once the Amber Alert was issued, just after 9 p.m. Central Time, the mother did turn herself in to Amaranth RCMP. Now, AP10 did reach out to the families involved in this matter, but have not heard back. Brittany, back to you. We'll be following that story and provide updates as they come. The organization representing First Nations in northern Manitoba is partnering up with the province's northern health region to fight racism. The province in the Manitoba Kiwetanawi Ogimaganak will focus on eliminating anti-First Nation racism in the healthcare system. First Nation people make up over 70% of the population served by the Northern Health Region. MKO and Northern Health Region say this partnership is long overdue. Here's MKO Grand Chief Garrison Sati with more. We have an opportunity 
to create a quality healthcare system for all Northern Manitobans. And this is the first step. It is the beginning of a government to government relationship with our counterparts. And uh, we need to develop concrete and tangible actions for Northern First Nations. British Columbia has announced changes to who is eligible in the province for COVID-19 vaccinations. BC's Chief Medical Health Officer Donnie, Dr. Bonnie Henry says anyone living in BC who is Indigenous and over the age of 18 can now book an appointment to be vaccinated. To date, BC has administered about 700,000 vaccines. There has been an uptake in cases recently with variants now affecting more young people. Time for a quick break. Coming up, Alberta's new school curriculum has some scratching their heads. This week, the Alberta government announced curriculum changes for kindergarten to grade six students across the province. The changes have some Indigenous leaders supporting it, and some who say more needs to be done. APTN's Chris Stewart has a story. Alberta Education Minister Adriana Lagrange announced a wholesale revamp of every aspect of the curriculum for Alberta elementary students from kindergarten to grade six. Lagrange says the new curriculum will improve the current one, parts of which have not been updated in decades, and that teaching about Indigenous history and culture will start early. Our children will be learning content-rich, factual information starting in kindergarten, going all the way through to grade six. They will learn about the um, uh, extraordinary uh, beauty of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit culture. They will learn it in art and music. They will learn it across all grades and all subjects. However, treaties won't be taught until grade four, and the topic of residential schools won't be mentioned until grade five. The new curriculum has support from Chief Billy Joe Lubican, who spoke at the virtual press conference. I, uh, I have uh, reviewed the K-6 uh, uh, curriculum uh, draft and I uh, very much supported and see it as a, as a really good start and uh, look forward to the grades 7 to 12 as mentioned. Former Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild supports the changes. He says that while residential schools are not taught until grade five, that can change. So let's say we do that for one year and we find out, well, next year let's try it in grade four or grade three or grade two or grade one uh, and work at it that way. It'll be a learning experience for sure, but uh, I think it's a good start. But you know what? We're Adam North Pagan is the president of the 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta. He criticized the hiring of Chris Champion as a consultant on the curriculum. Champion has said that blanket exercises brainwash children. Pagan says issues like treaties and residential schools must be taught much earlier, starting at grade one. Our young students need to be exposed to that, you know, uh, at, at a much younger age because uh, um, th there are future leaders, you know, and, and it's important that they have an awareness. And I realize that uh, the, whole th the whole thing that, uh, you know, it may traumatize, you know, children of that age, but I'm sure that the curriculum could have been curtailed, you know, where it would have been uh, age appropriate. Pagan is worried that the real truths of Canada's dark history won't be told. I'm concerned that it's going to be uh, uh, minimized or it's going to be rationalized, it's going to be justified. Uh, and, and as a result, you know, uh, the students are not going to be are really be able to maintain, uh, you know, the actual true history of, uh, you know, uh, of Canada. The new curriculum begins a pilot trial this fall, and it will be fully implemented in 2022. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. With Canada riding the crest into the third wave of COVID-19, government officials are saying immediate vaccinations are extremely imperative. While vaccination rates of Indigenous people are going better than expected, Ontario doctors are expressing their concerns over vaccine hesitancy in the province. Jamie Pashagumskum explains. The third wave is real. 
These are some of the dire warnings Indigenous services are giving. This is dangerous and we need to pay attention. We need to use everything we can in order to shut out this uh, virus. However, they do say vaccinations in Indigenous communities are making excellent progress and Indigenous services has just struck a deal with Saskatchewan to have all First Nations communities vaccinated with the first dose by June 30. But at a Zoom conference hosted by the Ontario Medical Association to address vaccine misinformation and myths, it was stated even after getting vaccinated, people need to continue public guidelines. Although more science is always needed and the vaccine is not a 100% guarantee, it's pretty darn good. And in my experience, it, it, I mean, whereas it doesn't make you bulletproof, it usually prevents you from the real outcomes that matter being sent to the emergency department, being sent to the ICU, or being sent to the grave. In their study, the Ontario doctors found most of the misinformation around vaccines is coming from men 55 to 64 in Ottawa and Eastern Ontario. By far but the most troubling for me is that this mistaken belief that it's going to be a real mild case for me, Dr. Rettelmeyer. Don't worry, I'm going to be one of of the lucky now of the lucky ones and it's just not true because it's often a bimodal disease all right they get sick for a while and then they get better and everybody gets lulled into a false sense of security but the classic trajectory unlike say a pneumococcal pneumonia or an influenza pneumonia is the second week is when things get really bad and you end up in the ICU. The doctors say a lot of the misinformation in the province is coming from this site BitChute and is spreading over social media. APTN reached out to the website for comment, but didn't hear back before deadline. Meanwhile, doctors recommended getting information from a more credible source and question people who are spreading myths. When your neighbor says to you, I'm not getting the vaccine because I heard it's an implant from Bill Gates or whatever, you can say, oh, really, where did you hear that? What did your doctor say about that? You know, do, do, you, do you know anyone who's had the vaccine and has behavior has changed you know indigenous services says there are ways uh, everyone areas, can help uh, such as the child care um you know for um, mothers in order to be able to get to uh, uh, the um, vaccination site uh, such as uh, uh, in some cases uh, transportation so arrangement for transportation removing the barriers for child care the biggest takeaway is that the third wave is hitting harder than any other previous wave and we're not out of it yet jamie pashagumsk on aptn national news ottawa a closer look at today's episode of In Focus, that's coming up after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. As the ice retreats and the geese return, this great photo of Lake Scugog, just north of Oshawa, Ontario, was sent in by our viewer Kaylee Goose. Keep those photos coming by sending your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our photo of the day. Here is another photo of the day for you from right, from right out of this world. The Curiosity Mars rover has taken some new photographs on the red planet. This shot was taken earlier this month. It shows Mont Mercu, a rocky outcrop that stands six meters tall. The panorama, panorama pic is made up of 60 images from the camera on the rover's robotic arm. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Here is your weather forecast beginning on the east coast. 5 above in St. John's, 13 degrees in Halifax, minus 7 in Nain, and 7 above in Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus 1 in some sun in Val d'Or, 15 above in Montreal, just one degree in Toronto, zero in London and Ottawa. One above in Timmins, five degrees in sunny skies in Sioux Lookout in northern Manitoba. Six above in Thompson, God's Lake and Norway House. Sunny skies in 14 in Brandon. Ten above in Gimli in Saskatchewan. A lot of sunny skies, 15 above in Saskatoon, 13 in North Battleford. 11 above in La Range and Buffalo Narrows. In northern Alberta, a mix of sun and cloud and 12 in Fort McMurray, 9 above in Grand Prairie. 
Sunny skies and 18 in Lethbridge, 15 above in Calgary, over to the west coast, 12 in Vancouver, 13 in Penticton and Kamloops, 4 above in Smithers, 1 in Dees Lake, in the Yukon, minus 4 and some sun in Dawson, 13 below in Old Crow, over to the NWT, 0 in Trout Lake and Fort Liard, minus 17 in Colville Lake, sunny skies and minus 23 in Tuktoyotuk, in Nunavut, minus 20 in Whale Cove, minus 23 in Chesterfield, sunny skies and at minus 25 in King Knight, minus 31 in Joe Haven. Earlier today on In Focus, Melissa Ridgen talked to the creator of the Bead Your Province project and some of the beaders who contributed. Take a look. When COVID first hit, we noticed that a lot of our relatives were having issues with uh, coping with the burdens of quarantine, pretty much. You yeah. know, it's hard when we're part of cultures where, you know, when times are hard, we come together. And now we're told to self-isolate and stay apart. And a lot of people were dealing with that, you know, in a pretty, it was hard for yeah. a lot of people. So we wanted to come up with a project that would kind of bring people together, like as a community. And it started with the United States. So I was already following CJ on her beading page on Coutine Creations, and I had seen the post about it. And so I'm like, you know what, I'll, I'm going to do it. Part of the reason why I did it was the water that's in the piece represents the teaching. So the water teaching is extremely paramount in the work that I do on my journey as well. But then in the gold that you see is a Mi'kmaq motif, and that was around honoring the ancestors and the elders and knowledge keepers that have been fighting for so long for recognition in Newfoundland, for status, and just for Indigenous people to be recognized. I was seeing CJ post things on social media, so, sorry, social media about none of it not getting done. And if it wasn't done, she couldn't release the, the map of Canada. Um, so I thought to myself, number one, how would I feel if I was from Nunavut and nobody completed our whole territory? Yeah. Like, can you imagine the impact that would have had on so many people? Yeah. Um, and number two, I thought, what about all the hard work that has gone into this already? Like, what about the people that have already submitted it? Um, so I actually sent a message to CJ on the morning before the deadline. And I said, um, hi, I'm interested. Has anyone committed to doing Nunavut? Her reply was simply no. Um, so I just sent a message back and said, okay, I'm starting now. And that's exactly what I did. So I dug out my beads. I started doing research. Um, I started looking up pictures on Google, on whatever you know I could find. Um, about the beautiful culture in none of it. And I was just so excited about completing this and just motivated to get it done um, that the piece just getting kept getting bigger and bigger. And it is pretty massive <laughs> for a beaded project. That's your APTN National News for this Wednesday, March 31st. For more Indigenous news, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now TikTok at APTN News. You can also find us at aptnnews.ca. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a great evening.